Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Music Den. I am, of course, your host, Armando Venditti. Hoping you guys are having a fantastic day, morning, evening, whenever you happen to be watching this episode. With me today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Bill Schuster. How are you doing, Bill? Doing well. How are you doing, Armando? Thank you for having me. Doing well for a second retake of this video. <laughs> <laughs> guys, bloopers happen all the time. So, oh, yeah. um, Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be doing a rank in the albums episode and no, it is not the pink Floyd episode that I keep promising everybody. I am sorry. Just going to have to wait a little longer. Bill's hiding his face because it's my fault. It's Bill's fault. <laughs> They're waiting on me. It's fine. It's fine. Just everyone know I've got my list ready for pink. Yeah. Floyd. Here we go. In this episode, we are going to be ranking the studio albums of one group by the name of Steely Dan. We talked about doing this album ranking for about, I guess, a couple of months now. And we just timing and, you know, the, and life gets in the way, right? I had just come back from Toronto. Bill's been dealing with some personal stuff, as we all do from time to time. But we're going to finally tackle this SOB and get it done and get it out to you. And hopefully you enjoy this. And um, yeah, it's going to be really good. So um, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a background on Steely Dan. Uh, Steely Dan mm, uh, formed in New York City. It, they, it's a bit of a weird history with the band. Um, fronted by Donald Fagan and Walter Becker. Donald Fagan on lead vocals and keyboards and piano, various instruments. Walter Becker on bass guitar, lead guitar at times, rhythm guitar, various instruments and production. Um, Jim Harder on drums. Danny Diaz on uh, guitar, fantastic guitar player. Also, Mr. Jeff Skunk Baxter, um, who went on to be in groups such as uh, Doobie Brothers and fantastic session musician. And also for the first album, uh, Mr. David Palmer, and not to be confused with D. Palmer from Jeff Hotel, whole other David Palmer, you know. Uh, David Palmer would leave the band shortly after the, I believe, that and the, the first tour for a camp by uh, camp by a thrill. And which would leave uh, Donald Fagan to take over um, lead vocals on the remaining recordings. Now, Steely and Dan have never really, hmm. they're listed as a rock band, but I would never really consider them like rock per se, right? I mean, what would you, what was, your, what would be your take on Steely and Dan in terms of musical? I kind of think they're beyond genre, really. I mean, they started out as a rock band, but mm -hmm. they obviously evolved in a jazzy direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but they incorporated a variety of styles of music and instruments along the way. So I, they kind of have their own category, really. But jazz rock overall would probably be the safest if you had to categorize, put a label on it. I would definitely agree. I would definitely agree. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with your patience and our indulgence, or some people would say overindulgence, but there you go, we are going to attempt between Mr. Bill Schuster and myself to rank all nine albums of the Steely Dan catalog. Um, for the record, guys, I've listened to all nine albums in one afternoon. I was hurting by the end of it because it was a long process. Um, I mean, I have, I have the first seven albums. I don't I have a physical copy of the last two, but that's what YouTube is for. Beautiful, you know, wonderful service in order to be able to stream albums. So, to carry on with the show, I will pass over to Bill, who will start with. Uh, his ranking. What is your number nine? Number nine? Number nine? Yes, John Lennon. <laughs> All right. Back in 1977, there was a lot going on in the Steely Dan camp. And 23 years after that, 
they released two against nature which is my number nine it's like thought i was going somewhere else didn't you <laughs> uh two against nature is <laughs> the comeback album the, the <laughs> grammy winner I mean, I, I think most people that are remotely familiar with the Steely Dan story know that they won the album of the year for Two Against Nature. It was their first album in 20 years uh, as Steely Dan, though uh, Becker and Fagan had worked on a comic ad, Donald Fagan's solo album in the 90s, which Becker produced. Yeah. But this was the real reunion. And uh, I kind of think that Grammy was more about uh, writing past wrongs, which the Grammy committee often does when they realize that they've shorted a major artist over the years during their best years. And well, let's give them this token award. I they know. finally have put out a new album. So now we have the opportunity to rectify. And that's mm -hmm. not to say this is a bad album. Mm -hmm. I was excited, like many Steely Dan fans, when it came out. Uh, Cousin Dupree. Uh, a kinky little uh, incestual song uh, actually got a lot of radio play on our local rock stations here in southern Illinois in the states. Uh, yeah, a very uh, unusual lyrical subject for a semi-radio hit, but uh, mm -hmm. right in line for the type of stuff that Becker and Fagan tend to write about. Yeah. Obviously, they always write about some pretty shady characters and. Lots of wild, kinky uh, stuff. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, musically, it's what one would expect uh, as a follow up to the last album they released twenty years prior. I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit less fussy, a little bit less. Uh... I don't think they put as much studio time in on this one. I don't think they were quite as controlling over the musicians as they were on, say, Gaucho previous to this. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a good album overall. But in my mind, it doesn't match up to the legendary stuff. Uh, it's good. I'm glad it exists. Good for them that they got further recognition, especially while Walter was still alive. Uh, yeah. Happy for them. They deserved it. So... Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad I have it, but frankly, I really never listened to it. This is the first time I've listened to it in years. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not bad. It's just, yeah, something's got to be at the bottom, and this is definitely it for me. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, as people probably would know, uh, we lost Walter Becker in 2017. You know, rest in, rest in peace, Mr. Walter Becker. Um. Yeah, that that track, Cousin Dupree, has, has a bit of a deliverance feel about it, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> you know, like yeah, just a little bit without the banjos, you know, <laughs> kind of a feel. But not uh, even angular banjos. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, really, exactly, exactly. No, it's a good choice. Uh, number nine, my number nine is probably going to shock the hell out of people. All right. uh, Mm. Gaucho. Wow. Yeah. Um from 1980. Oh my god. Yeah. I saw the look on your face, you know. If looks could actually kill it somehow. I mean, okay. Um, yeah, uh, 1980. Um th this is more of their like they started out. Steely Dancer is basically as a rock band, like as you said, and as the albums progressed, it they they basically moved away from that rock sound, went into a jazz slash kind of R and B sound, and this to me is their R and B album, you know, um, with songs like you know uh, Babylon Sisters. You know, Hey 19, uh, Glamour Profession, and, you know, the title track, Gaucho. Um, they're a very slick production. Uh, I mean, the musicianship on this album is fantastic. I mean, using people 
in terms of vocalists like Patty Austin and uh, Valerie Simpson of Ashford and Simpson and Michael McDonald, Jeff Beccaro on drums, you know, um, it's just, how can I put this? I really don't see much growth between Asia and this album for some reason. Do you know what I mean? Like, they were just, uh, they were on the ball musically. I mean, um, I just don't see much of a uh, of a change. You know, this is sort of, again, this, like, for me, this is their um, R&B album flat out, right? Uh, with some jazz elements put in kind of a thing, right? But, uh, yeah, and, uh, I know I'm going to get blasted in the comments probably, but, um, yeah, that's my number nine. <laughs> yes, so. it was surprising. <laughs> what was that? That was surprising. Yeah, really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, oh, no, but like I said, I mean, it's a good album. It's a very slick, sophisticated sounding album. Like um, the musicians they used were just amazing. Um, and it's got to be said by 70, um, after the Royal Scam, I believe it was the Royal Scam in 76, they basically got rid of the band and started using um session musicians uh for certain tracks and it just continued but uh yeah so okay that's my number nine and back over to bill all right well now that you have all the gaucho fans uh flustered yeah oh i know i'm gonna get the comments all right well back in 1970 oh no i'm not gonna try that again <laughs> <laughs> okay that must go along with everything else. Everything must go. This is the uh, final Steely Dan album. I'm going to assume that Donald's not going to put out an album as Steely Dan without Walter. At least I hope not. Touring without him is one thing, but without Walter, let's get real. That would not yeah. be a Steely Dan album. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, I, I actually, uh, I like this a bit more than Two Against Nature because I feel like it was a little more adventurous. Uh, they even had uh, Walter's first vocal since uh, the debut album. Yeah. So that was pretty interesting. Slang of Ages, just hearing his voice, I, I rather liked that change. I love Fagan's voice. It's very unique, but it's cool to have Walter actually come in on stuff like that yeah it was a long time coming mm -hmm. uh, god whacker's a a fun song another bizarre lyrical subject uh and it just it has a cool groove to it mm -hmm. but really uh even though i do like it better than two against nature it's still it is at least shorter than two against nature that's one thing in its favor too this is closer to 40 minutes two yeah. against nature was a little over 50 yeah, and the forty-minute length helps uh, because there is still that modern kind of cold clinical sound on a lot of it. Not quite as much as the previous, but enough that again, I can't quite rank it with more adventurous stuff from the glory years. Yeah, I'm glad they made it. I'm glad they made both these modern albums. But usually, when I sit down and play the Steely Dan catalog. I don't get as far as 2000 and 2003. So I hear you. I mean, good, but not well, essential. Yeah, I got you. Well, let, let me ask you something. Um, do you find that, not to go off on a tangent, but I'm about to, um, do you find that when you have like a legacy band um, come back with an album, say after like X amount of years, that the potency uh, of their work is still intact or has it diminished compared to their previous uh, offerings? I think it depends on the act. I think uh, uh, anybody that's seen me on any number of YouTube videos talking about music, if you have, you might have heard me talking about my love of Blue Oyster Cult. And you might have also heard me saying that I'm not a fan of their comeback album, okay. which a lot of people had as the, the best album of of uh, 2000 when it came out. Okay. To me, it's my least favorite. 
and they had a layoff of almost two decades also at that time and they were very diminished to my ears so that's the first one that instantly came to mind when you said that but then there are some like uh it's not quite as long a layoff but like say tears for fears in 2004 that was the yeah. first album since 89 with uh, Kurt back in the band with Roland. And I think everybody is a, it, that's an amazing album. So, Oh, you mean the, the everyone loves a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah. If, won't go there. I'm going on a tangent. There. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, yeah. Um, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think that I, 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 I think I agree with you. Like, um, I think it depends on the band. Um, the Choose for Fears, Everybody Loves a Happy Ending, to me is a ma is a masterpiece in terms of yeah. in terms of uh, pop craftsmanship. You know, it's like it's their Sergeant Pepper. But I mean, it, there are just certain groups, um, like you said, like Blue Oyster Cult. The album, the latest one, is called the S the Sign Remains or something like that. The, the symbol remains. The symbol remains. Sorry. Um, I've heard people say good things about it. People say bad things about it. I just, you know, um, I don't know. I think I, I agree with you. It depends on the, on the group. Um, but we must carry on, ladies and gentlemen. Um, forgive us for our indulgences right now. My number eight is um, Two Against Nature from 2000. Um. What to say about this album? Oh my god, um, it's a good album. Uh, yes, thank you for the prop, Bill. I love a man with a prop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, I like I like the album. I don't again. I don't. I don't see any progression, any growth, musically. Um, I mean, if for example, if they would have come out with like a for a traditional jazz album kind of thing, right? Um, that would have been a complete left turn kind of a thing for me. But I, I just feel that I mean, it is a good album. I mean, songs like Gaslighting Abbey, uh, the title track, you know, is really is really good. Um, you know, uh, Jamie Runaway and. Uh, Again, Cousin Dupree, get the banjos out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know. It's a good album. Um, there's just something missing compared to albums like Asia and, again, even Gaucho um, and The Royal Scam. I just think that there's just something a bit uh, missing there. So um, I can't even put my finger on it. Um, Maybe like you said, it's the fact that they really didn't, it sounds like they really didn't try hard enough or was sort of like phoning it in kind of on the production, but but that is my number eight, Two Against Nature. Um, back to Bill for his number seven. All right. Well, my props are going to change format now. The rest Ooh. are all on vinyl. <laughs> Ooh. Old school. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm not too far off from yours. My number seven is Gaucho. Ladies and gentlemen, that is called a record. <laughs> yes, it is. This is Gaucho. Uh, yeah. 1980, uh, the last album from their original run, album number seven. Um, it took three years uh, to follow up Asia, which was a very successful album for them commercially and critically. Mm -hmm. And the problem I have with Gaucho, well, I think the singles are great. I actually really like Pay 19. I think that's an excellent, well-crafted single. Babylon Sisters I like a lot, and Time Out of Mind. But uh, hey, I'm going to cheat on my notes a minute. Um, once you get past the singles, it feels... My wife, Stacy was actually sitting on the couch when I was listening to this earlier. And as it got later in the album, she said, this is literally putting me to sleep. And that's kind of the problem. It, it has, on most of the tracks, the same kind of tempo, the same kind of, I call it Fusac. 
and I think Tom Scott and Randy Brecker on the title track in particular, they really crossed the line into Fusac, which of course is fusion music taken into elevator music territory, essentially, uh, which is, it's a fine line, but I think they crossed it. I usually like the work that those guys do. I mean, they're professionals, but mm -hmm. it was a little too close to smooth jazz for me. And the whole album was kind of like that. Uh, it Basically, this is where Becker and Fagan decided to write pretty sounding jazzy background music rather than actually writing songs. It was oral wallpaper on a lot of this stuff. Very pretty. Very I like key. that. But it's like they, they had such great success with Asia. They, it's like they said, you know what, let's do that again they stopped evolving. I, I I feel like this is just kind of an inferior copy of Asia, essentially. And they got too fussy, obviously. I mean, Walter had all kinds of problems during the recording of this album. He had major drug issues. His uh, He got hit by a car. His girlfriend died of an OD, and her, her parents sued him. I mean, he was having a terrible time, which yeah, him and Donald were not getting along, and eventually all this stuff, of course, led to the band breaking up after this album. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I, I'm glad to have it. It's part of the classic seven, but it's pretty well always been the bottom. I, I tried to have it rise higher, but it just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Singles couldn't carry it. Okay, no, it's fine. I mean, seven. and... I forgot to mention when I did my little spiel that um, Gaucho, the title track, they were, I forget the name of the artist, the jazz artist, but they were sued yeah. by, um, he Keith released Jarrett. an album, he, Keith, Keith Jarrett. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. He released an album in 74 called Bel uh, Believer and they, they, he, he claimed that they basically stole uh, elements of his song for Gaucho and did not give him proper writing credit because he was expecting to see a writing credit on the on the album jacket or even inspired by da 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 right. And what happened was they did an interview for the album and they mentioned in print that the track Gaucho was inspired by. This I forget the name of the track by Keith Jarrett. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Sue me. Um, when he saw that in the interview, he's like, okay, that's it. Time to sue. So he sued them, and they came to a uh, amicable understanding, and uh, he's listed as a co-writer on that track. But yeah, I mean, I guess at that point, they were running out of steam. I mean... It happens to everybody. I mean, look at Queen with Hot Space. Um, we won't go there. Um, <laughs> That's a whole other story, too. <laughs> please. Um, okay, I won't even go there. Um, but yeah. Um, no, that's that that's good. That's it, you know. And again, these are all opinions, and there is no right or wrong answer. Um, my number seven is everything must go. Okay, good album to end off things with. Unfortunately, again, we lost Walter Becker in 2017. Uh, tracks on the album that really stood out for me. Uh, the last, the last mall, uh, things I missed the most, which you know is a good, it's a, it's a good track. It's really, it's you know, a nice melody to it. Thank you for the prop. Um, God Whacker is an interesting track, and you know, um, <clears throat> Green Book is another good track. Um, but again, do, would I, if I bought it, would I be listening to it on a regular basis? It take a lot of pot. I'm sorry, uh, in order to get into that mind frame. Uh, but uh, no, I, and and it got good reviews. It got you know good press. Um, it's a shame to see because uh, who knows what they would have come up with if they would have 
continue the recording uh, recording albums like every couple of years instead of the the long break that they took after so but yeah that's my number seven we're pretty close we have the the same bottom three in just very slightly different order yeah and guys for the record we did not talk about this we did not compare notes this is a complete shock to me as it is to bill so and on with the show you're number six all right uh, this has uh shocked me that it's fallen this far in my ranking because once upon a time this was my favorite steely dan album really? uh, back in 1977 they made an album which followed up my number six choice the royal scam <laughs> from 1976 uh this is still a great album frankly i was down to the wire today with this and then the, the uh, two that will be coming up next i was having a very hard time deciding what order this, these three went in but finally it was the coldness of the royal scam that uh, put me off there's some wonderful songs on here i love kid charlemagne don't take me alive my god that opening guitar it, that, yeah that uh the fez my dog is named fezix so i mean yeah and it's just a cool double entendre song there we're gonna do it without the fez on oh no <laughs> guys never forget your fez Haitian Divorce, of course, is a great, just a cool song. I mean, who doesn't love a song about Babs and Clean Willie? Yeah. My buddy over here, Babs and Clean Willie. That's my friends right there. It's all right, maybe not. Surely somewhere somebody <laughs> has some friends named Babs and Clean Willie. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this I, I can't really fault the album for the playing at all. It as usual, it has amazing players, lots of studio pros at this point. Yeah. And it's a very consistent album, sonically. All these songs sound like they're part of the same album. This is not a hodgepodge. This is very much the same recording session here. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention uh, there was one song in particular that was left off of this album that ended up on their first uh, Greatest Hits album that I used to own uh, here at the Western World. It's also... Uh, also on the Citizen Steely Dan box set, and you can find it on Steely Dan Gold compilation. So if you have not heard here at the Western World, it's a it's a nice song. And it's even though it was from these same session sessions, it it has a warmth, uh, a, a more of a human touch than a lot of the stuff on this album. I think it really would have helped if they had uh, put this on here. They put that song on here. Um, yeah still a great album love it apparently uh becker and fagan themselves at one point when this was reissued uh stated that this was the worst album cover of the 70s other than can't buy a thrill <laughs> so, <laughs> i i think it's a fantastic album cover i agree myself, because if you look at it it's basically saying corporate america or corporate anywhere in the world that can take over the common man, right? If you're not careful. Yeah. I mean, the concept of the uh, the vicious animal heads on top of the buildings and the guys yeah. sitting on the bench, yeah, it's a pretty obvious metaphor, but pretty powerful. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of uh, Selling England by the Pound by Genesis, that album cover. Yes, with the bench and the, yeah, and the lawnmower, yeah. And just in case, on the back, there's the guy's shoes. He does have a hole in his shoes. <laughs> Can't even afford new shoes. What are you gonna do? Yeah. And by the way, with that, you know, that image at the top that you showed me, that you know, that looking down reminded me of a date I had once. Not really good. Uh, <laughs> quite ugly, but that's another issue altogether. Um, you know, it's a good choice. I mean, <clears throat> um, my number six. The Royal Scam. Here uh, um, uh, you know, this <laughs> album, there we go. 
Thank you again for the prop. And, <laughs> and you know, in 76, I mean, this was at a time where most bands were releasing an album a year. Right? Some some bands were releasing two albums a year. Right? Uh, like the Beatles, Bowie, were signed to contracts where they had to do two albums a year and every month they had to promote a new single that was released and stuff, right? They had to release singles. Uh, this album is a good album. It's a lot It's a lot harder in terms of the good use of guitar. And um, if my research was correct, this was the last album that they used um, the original band. And they sort of ousted everybody. Uh, uh, but Danny Diaz was still used for session playing. Um, Kid Charlemagne's a fantastic track. Uh, uh, Cave of Altamira is, is great. The Fez. I mean, what what can you say about the Fez? Ladies and gentlemen, never forget your Fez, okay? <laughs> Don't ever forget your Fez. And I mean, they did it in such a way, they, they cloaked it in such a way that people really didn't catch on right away what it was about, right? Um, and uh, Green Earrings is, is another good track. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good album. It's a solid album. And the fact that uh, this was the last album that they did that featured heavy use of guitar, um, I kind of think that maybe they underused uh, Danny Diaz after this, right? Like, because he was such a he's such a good guitarist, right? Um, but uh, yeah, this is a really good album. Some it, it, for some people, it's their favorite album. Uh, me comes in number six. So, moving on to number five. We're still uh, pretty much on the same page here so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. This uh, again, as I said, this is very very close to the Royal Scam and the one that comes next, also. Are you going to say this... back in 77 again? <laughs> <laughs> back in 1975. Oh, okay. Katie lied. Speaking of Denny Diaz, there he is on the back with Donald. And yeah, here's uh, Michael McDonald and Jeff Picaro with their first, first uh, appearances as basically part of the band. Yeah. They were part of the last touring band, apparently. Uh, for mm -hmm. the, it was uh, between Countdown to Ecstasy and Pretzel Logic. They'd already stopped touring by this point. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's Walter. Yeah. Gary Katz, producer, and Roger Nichols, engineer. That's, I mean, the fact that you have basically a couple of studio pro, you know, Jeff Picaro and Michael McDonald on here, yeah. the producer and the engineer on here, all pictured, kind of tells you there wasn't really a band on katie lied it was already there's a lot of studio pros mentioned on here you got hugh mccracken who would be around forever he appears on the modern albums even the comeback albums yeah he they they used him a lot they used him on uh, as a steady you know uh, member uh, in, in the studio yeah obviously they like his playing so. mm -hmm. and yeah there's a lot of there's david page another future toto member yeah. along with Picaro there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, Jeff Picaro does all the drums on this album, except with for... the exception of track 10. Yeah. What's that? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. You can smack me later off camera. Um, <laughs> he plays drums. Jeff Picaro, fantastic drum player. Drummer. Drum player. Listen to me. Um, it's a Friday, guys. Um, he plays all drums uh, to track uh, 10, I believe on that album so it's, it's so how blaine plays uh any world that i'm welcome to that's yeah of course how blaine is a pretty famous session drummer himself it's, uh, but this this album i think is the last that has the uh the real warmth and humanness before they fully uh went towards that more 
harsh, brittle, smooth jazz, with one exception, which will come at one point. Uh, okay. I, I really like the album. It's I think this kind of is an underdog in the band's catalog. I yeah. usually don't hear people talk about it very much, but uh, there's some great songs on here. I love what Michael McDonald brings to this. I mean, yeah. this is kind of where he got his start. You know, before becoming, you know, before joining the Doobie Brothers, before before becoming Mister Yacht Rock. Yeah. yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah, his his vocals on stuff like "Any World That I'm Welcome To" I think is awesome. That's a really a, a really warm, nice human song, and his vocals are a good part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really I like this whole album. It's It seems insubstantial when looking at the song list, but when playing it, it's like there's not a lot of my all-time favorite Dan songs, but as an album, as a listening experience, it plays well from start to finish. Okay, yeah, as a cohesive piece, as a collective. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Um, there's that one track on the album, Everyone, Everybody's Gone to the Movies? Everyone's Gone to the Movies, yeah. Everyone's Gone, yeah. Um, we'll get into that in, in just a sec here. My number five is Katie Lied. Right. And again, ladies and gentlemen, we did not discuss this at all. I mean, nope. did we? No. Not, not one second of it. Um, yeah, um, I really didn't know this album existed. I mean, I was only five years old when it came out, for God's sake, in 75. Uh, again, produced by Gary Katz. Um, it's just a really well crafted, put together album. Uh, songs like Black Friday and uh, Bad Sneakers and uh, you know, Rose Darling, um, Dr. Wu. I mean, all the songs are good. And Michael McDonald has such a distinct vocal, um, style like his singing voice is so distinct um that when you listen back to it now you're like yep that's michael mcdonald because obviously right um and i think even michael mcdonald as a as a as a backup singer he brought a richness to the to the vocals on the like a soulfulness and a richness um that you know I don't know who else could have done it. Um, and again, every, everyone's gone to the movies. That's a fantastic track. It's just like, my God, you know, like unreal. Um, and it's unfortunate that this album didn't do as well as um, its previous album, Pretzel Logic. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and that's why that's why I say, when guys, when you think you've discovered or you think that you know all there is to know about music, you're always pleasantly surprised when there's something like this, like an album like that, you know, album like Katie Lied, uh, Katie Lied, come, Katie Lied, sorry, that comes up. It's a whole new world, right? And this is a pleasant surprise for me, but it is unfortunately number five. So, um, back to Bill. <laughs> number five in the Steely Dan catalog is still quite good. Yes, it is. Very damn good, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop a few hints here. I don't know if you can see the Charlie Parker concert uh billboard type thing up there behind me. Mm. Where I'm wearing my Joe Jackson the Duke shirt, which was his Duke Ellington tribute. Uh, foreshadowing that's a logic. Oh my god. And here's the uh the fold out with the band at the time. Oh, cool. And there's, of course, Skunk Baxter with his uh, hilarious uh, 70s porn stash. <laughs> and Denny yeah. Diaz with that amazing uh, lumberjack beard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, our records. You can't can't beat them. Yeah. For the yard, anyway. And there's the uh, pretzel vendor. Yeah. No, well, uh, the, these were the days where album covers actually meant something. Do you know what I mean like the, 
they were like something to look at and to get into, right? Um, yeah, no, I got you. So and there's well, obviously I've alluded to the the jazz uh, references here. You have Parker's band, which lyrically and musically references Charlie Parker and yeah. and music that he created and played on. Yeah. Uh, you have, of course, East St. Louis Tutelo or Tutelo or Tutelo, depending. Tutelo, 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 would have yeah, told yeah. you any number of different pronunciations. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a Duke Ellington Bubber Miley uh, co written song from way early in Duke Ellington days. And yeah. for many years, this was my only experience with Duke Ellington. And now oh. I'm a huge fan, have been for quite some time now, but. It's kind of amazing what they did with this cover because they use the guitar to really get that muted uh, trumpet sound that oh. Bubba Miley had back in those, you know, in the late twenties with the uh, Duke Ellington's orchestra at that time. Mm -hmm. It's cool how they recreated that without actually using brass. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the only full on cover that they ever did on one of their studio albums, which makes it very distinct. And then, of course, their biggest uh, pop hit here in the States went to number four. Uh, Ricky Don't Lose That Number has the uh, opening, dun, 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 which is uh, directly copped from Horace Silver's Songs of My Father. So you've got three different songs that are very directly copying or referencing uh, famous jazz musicians and music so that kind of foreshadows the band's future yeah but oddly enough the album itself is not very jazzy overall to my ears it's no. very much a quirky cool 70s uh almost easy listening pop album i was gonna, gonna say middle of the, yeah i was gonna say middle of the road yeah i mean that's mm. I mean, they're they're the usual. Uh, I think Quirky is putting it lightly because this is Steely Dan. They've got all kinds of bizarre lyrics and cool little song bits. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course, of course. Yeah, these it's just loaded with catchy songs, and it's uh, some of them are almost throwaway songs. They're so short. The album is only just over thirty-four minutes. Yeah, but yeah. it packs a punch. It's just loaded with hooks. Uh, yeah, it's it's awesome. I I think I did not expect this to be quite so high on my list. I kind of thought this was going to be back around number six where the Royal Scam ended up. But that's the cool thing about going through these old things, even if I'm familiar with them and having to really think about them. <laughs> yeah. Listen with fresh ears. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Um, I mean, doing my list, I mean my number three was going to be my number nine at one point, but that's a big jump too. I'm like, what the hell? Um, so yeah, no, I, again, they're not right or wrong answers. It's, it's what you like and what you like to listen to. And so um, you might want to hold that album up again. My number four is Petal Logic <laughs> with three for three. Um what to say everything that bill said about about the album i did all that um you know ricky don't lose that number that's a classic you know um night by night is another good song i like berry town you know um east st louis to lou the instrumental a nice little i think it ends off side one of course i'm yes i i'm like thinking of the cd Guys, I'm still in the CD more mode, but I have records too. Uh, so yeah, no, and the title track. Um, I I think by this point you kind of know, with the exception of the Royal Scam, in terms of the heavy guitar on the Royal Scam. And guys, when I say heavy, if you haven't heard the Royal Scam, it's not Metallica thrashing heavy. Okay, it's just more use of guitars in terms of harmonizing and, and textures and stuff. Um, but you could see even from pretzel logic that they were going more in a jazz vein, um, which is fine. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I think it's a, a fantastic album, um, which is why it is my number four. Um, and Ricky don't lose that number. I mean, my God, I mean, you grew, I, I you know, I mean, I, sorry, I grew up with three sisters. So right. AM radio was always on right in the house. And this track was always on the radio and I would always hear it, you know? So yeah, it's my number four, pretzel logic. So continue on with the show, guys. Your number three. All right. No. This is uh, another one that used to be my number one at one point in time. I had I already knew what my number one was going to be going into this, and that did not change. In fact, if anything, it was even more solidified after listening to it. But two and three, though, could have gone either way. That really, I, they're very different. I love different things about each. But uh, I'm going for real back to 1977 this time for Asia. This is an immaculate album. I, like I said, it was my favorite Steely Dan album at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the main exception for me. When during their evolution, when they went to that colder, more uh, studio pro jazzy sound. There was much more warmth on this album, I think. It wasn't quite as cold and brittle. Uh, I mean, my God, Deacon Blues can still bring me to tears sometimes. It almost did earlier listening to it. I love that. That might even be my favorite Steely Dan song. It's gorgeous. Really? And Asia with Wayne Shorter on, I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, side one is pretty much a perfect album side. Black Cow, Asia, and Deacon Blues. Just, wow, that's murderers. Yeah, right there. that's top notch, like right then and there. My God, yeah. Yeah. I was smoking a cigarette after after listening to that. <laughs> In my mind, guys, I don't smoke. But if I could, if I did smoke, I'd be smoking a cigarette after side one of Asia. Um, sorry. I'd have been dead already because I died behind the wheel after drinking all that scotch whiskey. But no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Side That's... two actually has, though Deacon Blues uh, was a bit of a hit and was a single. Side two actually has what were the two biggest hits here in the States, Peg opening the side and Josie closing the side. And those are both excellent pop songs. Well-deserved hits. Yeah. Um, th these guys could write hits pretty well anytime they wanted to, if they set their yeah. minds to it. Yeah. Uh, Home at Last is one of those songs that often gets overlooked i think it a lot of hardcore steely dan fans they'll really love that song appreciate what it is mm -hmm. it, it has very very strong lyrics too mm -hmm. i think i got the news is probably for most people including myself the weak link if there is one on this album yeah but it's still a great song yeah it's the only slight blemish for me and mm -hmm. it's very slight this this it would be difficult for me not to just give this a 10. I mean, it's legendary. And yeah. for probably most Steely Dan fans, this is going to be their number one. I talked to a, a friend of mine at work who is a musician and a Steely Dan fan. And yeah, his this is no contest, his number one. Yeah. It's, yeah, love it. At a year from now, it may be number two again. It may be number one again. I don't know. It depends on my mood. It's very yeah. different from the two remaining which is part of the charm. No, yeah, no, I mean, my God, uh, Black Cow, um, uh, the first food, Deacon Blue, and uh, that last track on side. Asia. Asia. Sorry, I'm having a brain fart. That first side for me was just like perfection. Yeah. You know, um, there's nothing much more that can be said about that one. Oh, there was to... one thing uh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. uh, I had noticed earlier. I've this is the same copy I've had. This uh, when my parents got divorced back in '82, my mom took a stack of records. Oh, she shit. had this and one of the two that's coming up, and those were the two that I imprinted on with Steely Dan, which is part of the reason probably they rank so high for me. Really, but after all these years, I had never noticed that uh all the brass was on side one anything that sounds like brass or woodwinds or anything on side two uh was apparently synth like home at last i believe it was there were things i could have sworn somebody was playing sax 
and it's got really? to be because there is no credit for any brass that I'm seeing here. Even when Peg? Uh, Peg has a lyric on, I'm not quite sure what that is. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I saw that in the, in the notes. Yeah. Okay. All so right. yeah, I, I, I'm amazed I've never noticed that before. That's another cool thing about doing these shows: you pick up little things like that that you know, forty yeah. some odd years later. Oh, no, oh, right on. Yeah. No, I mean it. it yeah, no, I didn't know that. I had no idea. Um, and again, I mean, that album is considered, Asia is considered to be their, um, dare I say, pinnacle yeah. of their success. And guys out there watching, if you want to check out a documentary, there's the documentary on the making of Asia, the recording of Asia with a VH1 classic album series. And it's quite good, actually. Uh, and what they do is they they gather all the studio musicians that played on the tracks, uh, and it's quite good. So, uh, but um, we must carry on. Um, I need to see that I have not seen it. No. Oh really? Yeah. Oh cool. no no no. We need to talk. As regular, it's really good. It is really good. Um, my number three is. What was at one point my number nine? Uh, it's a big bloody leap, man. Uh, Countdown to Ecstasy. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Schuster with the props. Amazing. Yes. Uh, came out in 73. Yeah, that was the ooh, ah moment. Um, did not do as well as... Uh, uh, can't buy a thrill. Eight tracks, um, somewhat some, somewhat lengthy. It's been a long day, guys. Um, but but a fantastic album. Um, leading off with I can, I I hope I say this right. Bodhisattva, right? Um, the lead off track, uh, which to me is your basic ragtime jazz arrangement, right? And it's just you know. It's just a great track. And the fact that they do like a dueling parts, you know, like between the keyboard and the guitar, the, the synth and the guitar, you know, like they do like a, I can do this better than you can kind of a thing, right? So um, mine is bigger than yours kind of a situation, right? Um, instruments, by the way. And um, I, I think it's a great track. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the two singles that were released from the album were uh, Showbiz Kids, which basically talks about, you know, someone who is in a privileged situation, forgetting what it's like to be um, needing things and being in, a, uh, being in a situation where you're not as fortunate. And it catches up to you eventually. And ladies and gentlemen, it always does at some point and on some level. Um, and My Old School, which was the second single from the album, you know, nice track. For me, the the uh the best track on the album for me is uh pearl of the quarter beautiful sentiment you know um someone who's saying that he's in love with a prostitute and you know sweetheart whenever you're done doing whatever you're doing out there i'm always here for you come on home beautiful slide guitar from mr jeb skunk baxter uh just an amazing song it could be a country song the arrangement could be a country song if you just slowed it down just a wee little bit. Um, fantastic. Um, and I am surprised that it was my number three. I mean, doing, like I'm writing out the list and I'm like, okay, this is number one. There's no, I know what my number one was going to be right from the very beginning. So uh, hopefully you haven't figured it out yet, guys. Um, or you, Bill. But um <laughs> Countdown to Ecstasy was going to be my number nine. And when I looked at it, I'm like, no, 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 it's got to go. And with songs like uh, Bodhisattva and Pearl of the Quarter, it had to go up on the list. So, And it's quite a jump, number six spots, man. So, yeah, that's my number three, Countdown to Ecstasy. So I'm just curious, why why was it uh, initially your number nine? What was your thought process? My thought process for these lists some usually is... Albums that I gravitate towards more. 
right? But when I listened to the album again, just to make sure, I thought, no, there's quality songwriting on this album. Uh, there's quality musicianship. The slide guitar on Pearl of the Quarter is just fantastic, right? And a good song for me can put me in a mood or can put me back in a in a place mentally. Uh, not that, well, I am mental, but that's another issue altogether. <laughs> um, you know, cuckoo. Um, but I mean, it just puts me in a certain spot mentally. Like, you know, like for example, when I hear uh, there's a song from um, not to divert for a second, but the song from um, April Wine tonight is a wonderful night to fall in love. I don't know if you've heard it. I haven't. Okay, you need to listen to it. That song, as I mentioned in my previous video that I just filmed today, when I hear that song, I am literally back in 1977. Right? I'm sitting on my on my veranda outside in the summer. It's a nice summer night. You got the, the windows open to the living room. The stereo is going. The music's coming out and you're hearing it. You're sitting on the veranda with a drink or with friends. And that music is just playing on the air. Like, you know, like it's just hanging in the air. Like you're just, you're just enveloped in it. And that's what certain songs do to me. So when I hear Pearl of the Quarter, I just, I think it's just a great emotional um, piece of music. And uh, that's what put it at number three for me. Right. So enough of my, uh, uh, you know, pontificating here. Uh, <laughs> that's my number three. So what's your number two? All right. Well, let's pull this out again. Number two is their number two album, Countdown to Ecstasy. And and yeah, it's, I, I think that's awesome that uh, you appreciate Pearl of the Quarter that much. That's long been a favorite of mine. That's another one of those real... Uh, sleeper songs in the steely dan catalog i think it gets overshadowed by yeah. bodhisattva and my old school and showbiz kids and king of the world and uh, it's just such a kind of a quiet unassuming sort of song compared to a lot of the more uh flashy or bombastic stuff on here um but yeah, it, it has a real a warmth to it. Yeah, it's it's a very just a nice touching song. I, and yeah, I'd never really thought of it being a country song. But yeah, if you put uh, take out Donald Fagan and put in one of the Eagles or something, their buddies there, and, and uh, maybe bring a steel guitar along, or or yeah. one of the country artists. Like, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, That's all right. But even if you put in one of the, like you know Willie Nelson or Merle Haggard or yeah you know Glenn I Campbell you know Glenn Campbell it. Glenn Campbell could have sung the shit out of that song you know what I mean like it's <laughs> you know so yeah, yeah I know what you mean yeah. uh, Bodhisattva that uh, when you were talking about the uh, the dueling instruments yeah I heard it in my head as you were talking about it and. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. It, and and the drums on that song, uh, Jim Hodder. The dude doesn't get enough appreciation. They've had so many, so many great drummers later on. I mean, legendary studio pros, jazz drummers. He kind of gets forgotten, and he doesn't deserve that. He was a damn fine drummer, and his playing on this song is just awesome. It's just full of energy. I went to uh, after Gaucho about put Stacy to sleep earlier, I went back <laughs> and uh, played this one. So I went from the last song on Gaucho right into Bodhisattva. And that was a wake up. It was, yep, you can tell a massive difference between Gaucho and Countdown to Ecstasy. Yeah. This was when they were still a band. I mean, David Palmer was gone, but I mean, he was the only a vocalist on a few of the songs on the debut and everybody else is still here and for that matter actually david is credited as one of the background vocalists so he's technically he's still here also yeah but, but this still you talked about denny diaz earlier and skunk baxter and yeah those guys uh larry carlton all those other studio pros they're great but denny and jeff 
were an awesome combo with a little bit of Elliot Randall thrown in here and there as a guest. But yeah, sorry, I forgot about Elliot Randall. Yeah, my my apologies. Yeah, uh, is these. Yeah, I I really wish this band could have stayed together as a band a little longer. I mean, obviously, my we all know what my number one is now. Count process of elimination. But when they were still a band is my favorite period of Steely Dan mm -hmm. before Donald and Walter took over and said, you know what, we're a studio project. You guys are superfluous. We are the band. Yeah. And whoever we decide to throw on here, mm -hmm. they still made wonderful music, but they didn't quite have the particular kind of magic that the early band did. Yeah, the the term heart gets thrown around quite a bit in terms of like, you know, there's 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 not enough heart in the music. Like, you know, there's not enough feeling or heart in the in the music and the recording. And it fits with with some of these recordings because I mean there there's an essence that's missing on everything must go and two against nature that isn't there anymore. And there's just something that wasn't there. And it's you know that that's how I that's how I interpret it. That's how I can explain it. Um yeah, I mean I just think uh like even with Bodhisattva, like I mean you can just imagine, okay, them doing it live and Fagan is standing there at the mic and he's counting harder in, okay, one, two, three, you know, like, and he's like, you know, harder is doing the intro on the drums and, and you can just imagine Fagan standing there, like snapping his fingers in time to count it in before he, he comes in on the vocal, right? That's what song, good songs do. Sorry. They sort of put you in a mentally... Well, again, I am mental, but they put you mentally in a in a frame of mind in like in a time and space that can't be explained, no. you know. Uh, and that's my Doctor Phil moment of the day. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned live Bodhisattva, and that made me remember on the second disc of the Citizen Steely Dan box set, there actually is a live version of Bodhisattva from back with the original band which is oh. pretty cool. It has this bizarre spoken intro by someone, Mr. Steely Dan. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's hilarious, but the band is hot. It's a great live version. Yeah. I don't know if okay. it's necessarily worth buying the whole Citizen Steely Dan box set for it, if unless you're looking to get the whole catalog at once if you don't have any. Okay. You know, what, cool. Bill, you know what, Bill? I'm coming to your house and I'm reading your, uh, your music collection. And... <laughs> <laughs> I will. I swear to God. Okay. Um, there, um, I go totally ahead. forgot. I wanted to mention one thing when I was talking about Asia. Go ahead. Uh, it was another one of those important tracks that didn't make a Steely Dan album. Uh, FM from the FM soundtrack that's came out right. after Asia. That's right. That's a classic. That's that's a killer song. It's that thing is made for radio. That was another one of those. Them. Let's write a hit. Okay. Here you go. Just mm -hmm. catchy as can be and just yeah classic love it it should have been on an album but it's also of course on the citizen steely dan <laughs> okay so, all right i gotta check right, out that yeah, set. countdown to ecstasy now that i've totally derailed and went every other direction yeah this is amazing awesome album last true gasp of the original band pretty much exactly exactly no you know what don't worry about going off on tangents with me, please. <laughs> it is what it is, guys. Um, Definitely happens. My number two, we must continue, ladies and gentlemen. My number two is um, their debut, Can't Buy a Thrill. And there we go again with the props. This <laughs> man is wonderful with the props. Thank you so much. Ooh, ah, you know, and oh, a gatefold. There we go. Yeah in the band there we go there's the money shot all right those cool. lyrics in blue are a little difficult to read if you have uh issues with color or but Wh why do that i don't for any for any people that design record come record album covers or 
do the text. Why would you do that? Like, I don't understand it. It's like putting a dark gray album cover and then putting light gray text instead of yes. red or yellow or white. Why? It doesn't work. No. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, That's no. Um, yeah. It's like, what the? You know, no wonder you can't read the, say the lyrics properly. You can't even fucking read it properly because you know, of, the, of the color distortion here. Um, yeah, I can't buy a throw their debut in 1972. Um, you know, fantastic album. Uh, you know, songs like Do It Again, um, Dirty Work, which I do remember hearing on radio, like with David Palmer on vocals. Uh, my favorite track, <laughs> Reeling in the Ears. I mean, come on. You know, like, it's just a good song, right? It's just a really catchy, memorable rock track. And, you know, um, I think it was uh, Jeff Baxter on lead guitar on that. And he just does an amazing job on the on the guitar solo. Um, but what I, what I like about what he did with uh, Denny Diaz was they did a lot of twinning of guitar parts, right? That one would play, they would basically play the same part. They would just... Uh, double track each other right and just sort of build up a really thick uh, a thicker rich sound on the guitar i think it's i think it's just a great album um midnight cruiser which i think features jim hodder on on vocals i got that one right thanks guys yes, <laughs> i i think it's a i i put this debut I'm not going to get the comments about this son of a bitch, but I put this debut in league with uh, Queen's debut. Yeah, it's that strong. It's that memorable. It's that melodic. I mean, different type of music, obviously. I mean, you would never call Steely Dan a heavy rock, you know, group. But the songs are melodic. They're catchy. They're hooky. If that's a phrase to use. Uh, and it's just a really good put the put this album on. You've got it playing in the background. You got people over, or if you just want to sit and have a coffee or a drink and just chill for the night, good album to listen to. So yeah, that's my number two. What? Now the moment of truth. All right, well, I think we we kind of know what's coming. Here. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> All right. I hope it's not too rude to correct the host, but I'll save you from getting raked over in the comments. The uh, guitar solo on Reeling in the Ears was actually played by guest Elliot Randall. Really? And that's Jimmy Page uh, has actually, I don't know, it's been a long time ago, but he's actually called that his favorite guitar solo. Really? No, because you know, okay. All right. Okay. Slap me silly. All right. Um, so he's even credited. Well, you can't read it here in Dudley, but yeah, solo by Elliot Randall. Just yeah, cool. So no, 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 because they thought it was great. No, because I on that documentary of um of uh, a classic album series, they it's it starts off with a live piece of footage of them playing "Reeling in the Years" at the at the start of the song, and. Uh, Jeff Baxter plays the intro, right? So I automatically thought he's doing the solo. So my fault. Makes sense. My fault. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that would be definitely the assumption because yeah, Elliot Randall's not a member of the band, and yeah. generally, I mean, they had some guests here. Uh, Victor Feldman, see her on percussion as a guest, and of course, Victor Feldman would appear on various Steely Dan albums for a few years yeah. to come. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but mostly it was the band, just that the original group were all playing. I think one of the great things I really like about this album, other than the fact that every song is distinct from all the others and catchy as hell in its own way, and all unusual, uh, I like the fact that they have multiple vocalists here. 
Yeah. I, I miss David Palmer after this. I don't think he's as good a vocalist or as interesting as Fagan, but I think he's a nice counterbalance. I think he does a wonderful job on Brooklyn and uh, change of the guard and turn that heartbeat over again. And even Walker or uh, yeah, Walker Walter is uh, along with Donald and David is credited as a vocalist on turn that heartbeat over again, which is possibly my favorite song on the album. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, yeah, I, I love Jim Hodder's vocal on midnight cruiser. It just helps with the variety. Yeah. That's really part of the charm here. I love yeah. those bands that have multiple vocalists and when, even though Donald is very distinctive, when he took over all the vocals, it took away, it was like they uh, took away one of their strong points. They said, ah, we don't need that anymore. And yeah, it, yeah, no, I, I completely get what you're saying. I completely get what you're saying. Yeah, this... Uh, this is kind of one of those albums that, uh, well, this is not only my favorite Steely Dan album, it's my favorite album of 1972, period. Uh, Bloody hell. Yeah, 72 is a strong year. So, but um, my second favorite is Honky Chateau, my favorite Elton John album, which is uh, funny enough, it has kind of the same setup. This starts off, side one would do it again, the big hit. Side two with Reeling in the Ears, the big hit. And of course, Elton's album starts one side with Rocket Man and one side with Honky Cat, two big hits off that album. Yeah. So that was, yeah. I thought that was just kind of cool for my own little uh, thing. Mm -hmm. My two favorite albums of 72 and by these mm -hmm. two artists, how connected they are there. Um, but like that album, though, I still don't get tired of those songs. I've heard Do It Again and Reeling in the Ears a million times back when I was still listening to the radio. But when I play this album, I think I'll look forward to the other songs. But while those hits are playing, I'm totally on board and enjoying every bit of it. There's no burnout. And this that's the thing. This thing continues to get stronger. Uh when I was a teenager back in the 80s, when I was really starting to dig into the catalog, I had friends that were just a little bit older than me, and I would play the Steely Dan albums, and at that point, we're talking 85, 86, they were telling me that, oh, they're good, but I'm so burnt out on Steely Dan, and of course, that time, you know, Gaucho had just been five or six years prior. Now we're talking this four decades later here, basically. And I'm still not burnt out on this catalog. And I still am happy to just throw these albums on and go one after the other. That says a lot. It's gone the test of time. And yeah. these albums have stood for the most part. Barring everything must go and <laughs> two against nature. Um, have stood maybe the test day. of time. Sorry? Say maybe one day. <laughs> maybe one day, yeah of you know the the original seven albums have stood the test of time yeah. you know um and i disagree with donald and walter this is not the worst album cover to 70s i think this is totally cool it's of its time and it's wonderful for that it's gaudy as hell it looks uh looks great hanging on the wall too yeah you know when i think about when i see the album cover american graffiti I could see that. That's uh, not far off from the time frame there, either, as far as when American came out. 73, yeah. Because of the, the font that they use and yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. They really should have kept that logo, too. That's a very... That's a distinct logo, logo. Yeah. 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 That was kind of a waste not to keep that going. Yeah. Yeah. No, anyway, I, yeah, I get, that's... I get what you're saying, no, because seriously... Um, you're mentioning about, you know, listening to albums that, you know, that, you know, you had older friends that said, you know, you know, oh, you know, I'm burnt down on Steely Dan. I had a brother-in-law, I've said in other videos, uh, who's no longer with us, ex-brother-in-law, who literally would bring over his albums and just put them on and have me listen to, have us listen to them and like, you know, the Beatles and Queen and, and Springsteen and all these albums. And it's like, 
I, uh, how old was I? Like 10 years old? And I'd be getting into all this stuff. And it's like kids at the age of 10, what 10 year old kid gets into, into Sergeant Pepper or Abbey Road or the river? You know what I mean? It's very rare. Oh, right? taste. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I tip my hat to you. Um, no, it, it's true. It's, it's what you're, but it's what you're surrounded by, right? In terms of music and stuff. So yeah, no, that's that's a good choice. Um, my yeah, number the one. record. Oh, I'm sorry. No, one no. last thing, and I'll shut up. No, no, uh, no. This is my parents' original '72 copy, and uh, my dad's name is still written on the front of the cover. It's oh, Jesus see, Christ! But yeah. So this is this baby's been around for uh, 51 years in the family, oh, and it sweet still Jesus. plays great. Oh, sweet Jesus! Oh my God. Okay. All right. That's okay. all. Okay. <laughs> Guys, you remember back in the days when you go to house parties and you'd write your names on your album so that they wouldn't get lost? And sometimes you wouldn't put tape on the album cover because you didn't want to ruin the album cover, but you write, you write on it anyway. It's like, this is what happens, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's history, guys. It's history, right? And it's good history to have. Um, but to carry on, ladies and gentlemen, my number one, if you haven't guessed it already, I think Bill can guess it. Asia. There you go. Released in 1977. Fantastic. There you I'm go. I'm going to read all the stuff, but... <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. Um, this... For some people, for most people, is considered to be Steely Dan's uh, magnum opus, the pinnacle of what they were trying to achieve. You could see that this album was what they were trying to push towards, um, achieving what they thought was uh, musical excellence. And it is from top to bottom. I mean, uh, first of all, instead of getting into the songs right away, um the production of it um just the sound of it it is sophistication galore i mean songs like black cow uh title of track you know eight minutes and change this is when they were getting into they were doing more lengthy i guess you'd say experimental tracks uh it was it's a combination of I, I call it jazz fusion R and B slash pop music. And your dog agrees. Yes, my apologies for that, folks. No, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a family oriented show. And there you go. <laughs> Someone is knocking at the door and triggering the dogs out there. So. There you go. No, it's no problem. It's no problem. Um where is that? Okay, Black Cow starts off the album, Asia. Uh, ends side one um, peg you know pop perfection right and uh, you know with Michael McDonald on backing vocals um, Deacon Blue you know another seven minute plus opus um, and I gotta tell you I years ago picked up a Steely Dan's Greatest Hits on CD through MCA because MCA bought ABC Records and uh Basically, uh, it dissolved into MCA. So anyone that was signed to um, ABC Dunhill was either kicked off or moved over to MCA. Not that I know this stuff, by the way. Um, when I heard Deacon Blue for the first time, I was like, okay. I couldn't really get into it. I couldn't understand it, right? Um, but maybe I wasn't ready to to understand it, right? Songs come to you at different points in your life and you don't question when you do like something, you just like it, right? And I don't care whether it's ABBA or whether it's Frank Zappa, you know where I'm going with that, right? I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Um, Deacon Blue is a fantastic piece of work. Josie, the second single from the album, ends the album. You know, Home at Last, um, I got the news, yeah, I got the news could be considered one of the more weaker tracks, but you know what? 
it is what it is. I mean, but not by much. I mean, it, you know, it's it's you know, it's no right track. But for me, top to bottom, this album just bloody sores. And it is, I mean, it. I mean, the you know how people say uh, when when music critics say, "Oh, this is the this is the group's Sgt. Pepper's," or "This is the group's Dark Side of the Moon," or you know, this album should be included in that listing. You know what I mean? This for me is Daily Dan, Sgt. Pepper. It is their Dark Side of the Moon. You know what I mean? It is their an IP opera. It is top to bottom perfection. And there's no way around that. So yeah, Asia is my number one. You know. But um yeah, that's quite the list there, guys. <laughs> you know, like hopefully you guys enjoy this uh, this list. Um but yeah, I mean we were similar we were identical on um some of them. Very what? close and on the overall list, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, but um, yeah. you I mean, had Asia slightly higher and Gaucho slightly lower, but other than that, we were matching up. My apologies, folks. I can tell my granddaughter and the kids and everybody just showed up in the other room, and I don't have any way to block the sound other than muting here, which I don't, so, I don't, hear, I don't hear anything. We're fine. Okay, good deal. Don't ever listen. Do not ever apologize for stuff like that. Really, like it's not a problem. But um, yeah, so guys, this is our list from nine to one. Steely Dan ranking the albums. Please, down there, down below, please put your comments. You know what Bill just did. Um, <laughs> put your comments um, about Steely Dan. Put us, give us your ranking. What do you think of Steely Dan? Do you like Steely Dan? Do you think they're overblown? Do you think they're underrated? What have you? Let us know what you think. And um, also, Bill's going to be joining me at some point, at some point, <laughs> for the Pink Floyd album ranking. We've got 15 albums to, is it 15? 15 albums to talk about. So, yeah. And, yeah, so when that happens, before you tune in, literally, get some food. Get some, get something to drink, and just sit back, light one if you got one, and enjoy. <laughs> All right. But uh, for now, we will say good night. So for Mr. Bill Schuster, I will, uh, you know, and I want to thank you, Bill, very much for doing this episode with me. It was a blast. Yes, it was. Thank it was you for having me, Armando. Yeah. Anytime, time. anytime you want to come back on, you are always welcome on this channel. I promise you that. So guys, we will bid you a good night. Please look, first and foremost, click like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep yourselves on top of any new content that we've got coming up. I should put down a shirt, you know. Um, that way I can just wear it, you know. <laughs> um, this has been a fun show. Please join me uh, for my next episode. I'm going to be doing an episode with uh, Mr. Peter Kent from the Lizard King channel. And please check out his content. We're going to be doing an album discussion on Kiss Harder Than Hell from 1974 uh that's going to be taped tomorrow so yeah exactly <laughs> yes 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 um should have you on that one too <laughs> and uh so yeah guys have a good night and we will uh see you very soon okay bye for now <laughs>